Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks um, for inviting me again, Mario Lane. And actually, uh, with extension, the whole Capture uh, and U Ghent University ecosystem. Um, it's a real pleasure always to give these lectures because, of course, I was like kind of scientifically raised at Ghent University. Uh, slash Capture, I worked a couple of years for Capture. And, uh, and uh, now I'm outside, I'm uh, in my own business. But still, we work together a lot. And there is so much to talk about. Um, the last time I was here was two years ago, in 2020, exactly the, 20, the 20th of February, 2020. So I think that was right before COVID ha hit us all. So that was one of the last live lectures. Uh, so yeah, looking back at that, and then I was looking at the slides of two years ago, and then I concluded, oh my God, so many things changed in these two years. Uh, if you look at everything, the whole world, of course, but also our company, all the activities we are doing, I had to update the whole slideshow. Not, not many things were still relevant. And that, that's what happens huh? when you're working in digital activities. Um, digital pro progress is so fast that two years is a huge amount of time. And that's also the core message of this whole lecture. Where are we going? What are really the big trends that cannot be neglected? Um, yeah, I, of course, I cannot predict the future, but I can say what we are doing and what we are doing that was not able, like not possible five years ago, for example. So that's th those things I would like to touch upon. Uh, so yeah, I'm Wim Odenaert. Um, I will give a short introduction of myself, but I'm CEO and co-founder at AM Team. We are a company specialized in advanced modeling services for the global water industry, with extension the process industry, because they have exactly the same problems. I mean, pharma companies, food companies, they have exactly the same problems. I will also relate to that. Uh, but there's so much digital work to be done that we were so glad to found this company in 2017, five years ago. We, so now we are celebrating our fifth anniversary, still surviving. Well, the opposite, actually, we are growing quite fast and it's, it's a lot of challenges. So yeah, again, very proud to be here uh, and to be lecturing here. That's uh, very good. So um, yeah, let's start with this graph or this figure. I, I've, I'm not sure if you have ever seen it, but I shared it on LinkedIn uh, two or three weeks ago. It's a book that is uh, written on the topic of AI, artificial intelligence, life 3.0. This figure is not from the book, but it is from a scientific, scientific publication by Hans Moravec. And he was like a very, very early bird talking about AI in the 70s, 80s already <clears throat> and what was going to happen. And if you look at what's going to happen and what's currently happening, it's very interesting because uh, this is a landscape of human competence. So this is like what we as humans can do better than computers or we can do and computers cannot even do it, right? So that's the landscape of human competence. But all we know, of course, we already have self-driving cars today. We already know a computer beats us as, as chess. We know from the 70s, the 80s, that the computer is way better at arithmetic. Five times five is 25. A computer can do it in milliseconds. We need maybe one second. And then, of course, you can go, it's way complex. So, of course, computers are taking over. We know that's already for decades. But what we are now going to face is a, a whole revolution where uh, computers will not be only a support, but probably they will do things way better than us. And probably they will teach us new things. And that's a whole other par paradigm shift. The same is going to happen in the water industry. Everybody is talking about digital twins, digital revolution, digitalization, digital water. Uh, but the, yeah, probably what is the coming 20 years, there will be so many big changes happening that are really unprecedented. I strongly believe in that. Uh, so this topic, the real core topic of this talk is the big shift from models as a decision support tool to models as tools that teach us new things. Uh, it's a very, very big difference. And I, I will try to give some examples in this talk. Personal introduction, one slide. In the US, they call me Elvis. Uh, so I, I like some music performances from time to time. It's really what I love, life to, do, love to do. Uh, but it's not the only thing I'm doing. If I could do it full time, watch out. I would do it probably. But I'm not that good of a singer. But I, I'm more of a performer than a singer. And combined, it's, people forgive you for your sing singing skills. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO at the M team. Uh, I'm a husband and father of three kids and uh, within one or two weeks, four kids. 
And then actually, my, one of my favorite quotes, I have so many quotes I like, but one of my favorite quotes is, every threat to the status quo is an opportunity in disguise. And when you look at digital, this is really what summarizes everything. I think a lot of digital solutions are threatening the status quo, the old way of working, the old rules of thumb, the old uh, ways of making money when you're an engineering company. Um, and that's threatening for many people. And some people are even fighting against that. But it's a matter of time. Uh, you cannot really stop it. And if you turn it around and you see the big opportunities, well, that's something else. You start surfing on the waves and you're, there's really a huge amount of opportunities, way more opportunities than anyone can grasp. So that's the good news. You can say, oh, somebody else is already doing it. Well, there's so many that nobody is doing, is currently grasping all the opportunities. About AM team, so our company name comes from the A team, which you might know. Uh, not, well, mo most of the people know the A team. Huh? They are like, uh, this is a television series from the 80s. And uh, I, wa I was still a bit young at that age. It's more my older brothers that watched it. That's that generation. I only saw, saw a couple of episodes. But then, of course, they started broadcasting it again and again and again. They made cartoons of, of it. And that's why many, many generations today still know it. It's all about a special team of people. Individually, they are worth not too much. But if you throw them together, they're extremely complementary. And then they can do missions not many other teams would dare to take. And that's the core philosophy behind our company. There are actually three core values integrated in our name. We have five core values. Three of them are in our name. Is the team spirit. So a team is much more than a bunch of individuals. That's a core value of our company. Second is the fun factor. Of course, making a relation with this American television series is a fun factor. So um, the fun is a very important core value in our company. And the other one is ambition. So we really take on projects that not many other companies would dare to take. And we are pioneers in many fronts. Uh, and yeah, we dare to take calculated risks. Like, literally calculated, we are modelers. Eh? But we, uh, we like that. Uh, we like innovation and we like uh, developing new solutions. Um, the why of our company, and that's a good way to start here. Huh? What is the why? Why do we exist in the first place? Why are we spending all of these hours in this company? Why are we spending all of this money in the growth? Well, it's because we challenge the status quo in process engineering for optimal use of resources. That's the core mission of our company. Very wide, very broad. We are not a water company. We are not a modeling company. We challenge the status quo in process engineering for optimal use of resources. Today, we believe it's best done with mathematical models. Coming 20 years, this will be our core mission, like how we will make it through. But who knows, within 30 years, we change completely. We, we are not a modeling company anymore. But currently, this is, a, well, this is the mission that will hopefully always be there. Optimal use, use of resources is very wide, and I will give some introduction on that. This is our current team. Um, yeah, I mean, if you ask me what makes me personally most proud as a co-founder of this company, it is all the beautiful people we work with. It is a balanced team. So in gender, ethnicity, in culture, there are a lot of things that are, yeah, we, we really like about this team. And it's a very international team. So we have many, many nationalities, people from all over the world, and they come to the beautiful Ghent. This is really the, the beauty of Ghent. You can really attract those people and keep them. Um, I think that's a big asset. Yeah. Well, not that anyone from the city of Ghent is watching, but yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we will keep growing this, this team, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really a dynamic team full of uh, motivated people. So, so, so great to work with. Uh, and yeah, I said a lot changed because two years, exactly two years ago, I was talking in this lecture. And uh, if you look where I was then, so we, this is the team size, huh? the team size of a company. So it's quite of an exponential growth we are facing. But you can see, what, uh, two years ago, we were still here with a team of around 12, 13 people. Yeah, it has more than doubled. We are close to 25. And within a couple of months, we are with 30 people. Um, it's, I just want to put this curve here. Not yeah, like We are doing well. We are growing. But a lot of things are changing. From management point of view, finance of view, how you structure a company, Today is completely different than two years ago. Uh, just wanted to give this because, yeah, you have your technology and R&D developments and helping your customers, but you also have to work on your business 
and that's a challenge on its own. So what do we do? Eh? We provide advanced modeling services to the global uh, process industry and water industry. So we help people with accelerating R&D, process optimization, better design, scale up of technologies, and smart operation. So it's a whole cycle of, of technologies. And we work, of course, with a lot of customers in the water industry. You, you will probably recognize a lot of these logos. It's end users, consulting and engineering firms, and technology vendors. These three big categories are all of our customers. They have specific questions uh, we, we help answering. So of course, you can see a lot of drinking water utilities here, a lot of wastewater utilities, and then uh, yeah, some end users from the chemical or pharma industry, or engineering firms, or technology companies, a lot of them. Working on various topics from biological, physical chemical, electrochemical, physical. Uh, so it's all kinds of treatment process they are working on. And uh, what, really, what we really try to do in our business is combining process simulation capabilities and process understanding. So we are not disconnected modeling nerds, eh? but we are also not 100% process engineers. We really try to combine all of this, which of course leads to way better solutions uh, tailored to the needs of the customers. Yeah, but this is the sales talk. It will not go on forever. I'm, I'm just putting you at ease. Uh, <laughs> but um, another thing next to the team, I'm very proud of being a nerd. I, I also have a PhD. Eh? I mean, we are passionate. We are passionate about science. That we really combine all of these big disciplines. Physics gives rise, rise to chemistry, right? Without physics, you don't have chemical molecules. Chemistry gives rise to biology. Without chemi chemical molecules, you don't have biology. So the, the, this is like the sequence, physics, chemistry, biology. And we combine all of these things in our business on a daily basis. This is why customers pay us for, for using this formula on a daily basis. Well, maybe a quiz, uh, do you know that formula? Yeah, rho, M, rho G, H, yeah? Hydrostatic pressure. Yeah? So there's one is hydrostatic pressure, a physics equation. Uh, it's a chemical equation, so acid, acid equilibrium. This is a, a CSTR, so a, so a reactor formula, com with ordinary differential equations describing the mass balance in this reactor. But of course, if you are a big nerd, you can go to PDEs. So these are the partial differential equations. For example, the X, Y, Z, these three directions. If you have a CFD model, for example, a 3D simulation of a reactor, things are happening in three dimensions. So you need an equation for each of the dimensions. That's in there. This is uh, the mono, right? Mono kinetics. So uh, all these things we really combine sometimes in just one single model for a client. If you just think about it, I was thinking about it uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, it makes you proud because we make best use of all the things we know. I, well, of course, we try to do that, but that motivates me per personally a lot that we just combine all of these things, even in one project sometimes, in one model. So yeah, what makes us comp our company unique that we, of course, yeah, try to develop new models as well. A good example is Amazon. Amazon is a, yeah, it's world's first engineering model for ozonation and advanced oxidation processes. So it's a model that can really predict the chemistry behind these complex processes. And if you can do that, you can start using these models for design, for operation, you can start uh, replacing physical piloting with a computer simulation. It has a really big impact. Um, we were proud to win the Water Europe Innovation Award uh, with this model. Our team worked on this for four years, and now we are really applying it for, for many, many, many customers. So today, I'm not saying forever, but today we, we focus on mechanistic models. This means models based on known physics, known chemistry, and known biology. This is the core activity of our company. I'm not saying we will never do AI or data-driven or statistics. Right now, it, this is the focus. Because we believe there's so much to do. We, we use big categories, two big categories of them. CFD, computational fluid dynamics models. These nice colorful drawings of a, of a scheme, of a reactor. Ah, this is how my flow goes if I, if I change the mixer. This is what's going to happen. 3D, very nice, colorful things everybody understands. And then we have kinetic modeling, chemical, bio, biochemical kinetics. And then you have like a, a tool here. There's a flow coming in. 
and you have some nice output dynamically as a function of time. The purpose of these two are completely different, but they can be combined. But I will give some examples in this lecture. OK, now we go to the mission of the process engineer. Eh? What we try to do, of course, eh, think strategically from a commercial point of view, our customers are process engineers. So why not make our mission the same as the mission of the process engineer then? Then we'd, we would sell more, we think. So let's start with our mission again, challenging the status quo in process engineering for optimal use of resources. Well, this is an industrial process. A process? So a treatment or a purification process. It can be a membrane, it can be a bioreactor, it can be a treatment or a purification process. In the food industry, it can be a potato processing process. In the pharma company, it can be a process producing the COVID vaccine. That's the process. Regardless of the industry, you always have an input. This is the stuff to be treated or processed. You just put it in and you expect something coming out. That's your output. But of course, you are the process engineer. It costs a hell of a lot of money. So you need an output you want. So this is what you want. Output has two core properties you want, a quality and a quantity. This is your biggest, biggest concern if you're a process engineer, the quantity and the quality. You can do a lot of R&D here, but your real, your real end goal is this. And preferably, you do it with optimal use of resources because it doesn't happen automatically. Water is not treated automatically. It's not enough to throw some bacteria in a bioreactor. Unfortunately, you need to put some air in. Unfortunately, you need to put some electricity in the pump to fill that bioreactor. So that's the input. You, it doesn't happen automatically. It happens automatically in nature, but not in engineered systems. So you need to put in some resources. People often say, OK, electricity, chemicals, yes. No, it's wider. You have to put in your own time. Maybe you need an operator on your pilot plant for two years. You need to do pilot tests. Maybe you need a stainless steel pilot reactor for two years. That costs you 300,000 euros when you build your full scale that gets discarded. So resources in process engineering are wide. It's very, very wide. We look at it from a huge, like, wide angle. So the operational part is just one. So your mission as a process engineer is to obtain the desired output with optimal use of resources. I think that's your core mission. Of course, if you, if you don't disagree, please re raise your hand or ask questions. But I think, yeah, from our point of view, this is really the core mission. Definitely, if you look at the climate change impacts, and definitely if you look at scarcity of materials, scarcity of resources, it's very acute. Huh? So, um, well, how are we trying to help here? Huh? If you look at the conventional way, just look at the point of view of, OK, guys, we are not going to use any models. Let's do 100% experimental based trialing. Well, this is currently what happens. You only do experimenting and piloting because you want your desired system. So you start trialing, trial and error often, because, yeah, you cannot measure everything. Something, sometimes experiments go wrong, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money. Learning is limited. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not like uh, belittling experimenting. I'm also not saying mathematical models are the solution. But I'm saying probably we can do the whole thing much smarter by combining them in a, in a right way. So this is the reality. And it's often the culture in the water industry. It's often the culture in a lot of process industries. Experiment-based, trial and error-based scale-up design operation. So it's uh, yeah worrisome. Sometimes you have a sleepless night as a process engineer. And what we try to do is we, cr we try to create the virtual reality. So we, oh, sorry, we build a model of the system. So then we build the virtual reality. We build a model of the system. Um, if you have a model of the system, you can do virtual experimenting, which is called simulation. Simulation is virtual experimentation. You design your virtual desired system. When you have found it, you can go back to reality and you can build it. So that's the shortcut we try to, of course, make. Of course, you have to develop sometimes. Eh? Sometimes you need some data. But this is like the core philosophy. This is a scheme from Biomat, from uh, Professor Ingmar Nopens, 
who is also a co-founder of this company. Okay, so what does that mean? Eh? You are doing trial and error based experimenting. Okay, yeah. So let's zoom in on that. What do you, what do you then try to answer? Why do you take that sample? Why do you change that pipe in your reactor? Why? Well, because you want to answer four big questions. You want to, just remember, you have the input and your process and the output. This is input. And this is the process engineering and, the, and, and what relates to the output. Yeah? So your input in the water industry is an incoming water quality, a quantity and a quality. Drinking water uh, with a certain salinity, seawater, wastewater, whatever. It contains organics, inorganics, some solids and temperature and some other properties. It comes in and this challenges your process. Yeah? And then of course you have to engineer your process and then we are at the process site. You have to have certain equipment and to make your process work. A reactor is nothing else than a house of your bacteria. Your real process are your bacteria, but you need to house them in something, which is an engineered system. This is this. But your choices matter. How do you, where do you inject your air? Do you, what is the geometry of your system? This is the engineering part here. But then, of course, you have process settings. Can we change the airflow rates, water flow rates? Uh, can we control the temperature? That's something else. That's not a design thing. That's an operational thing. And then, of course, you have somebody operating it. In some cases, it makes, it makes a huge difference. Who does which experiment how? For example, you have to add a chemical in the lab. If you have fast chemical kinetics, it matters who adds it and how fast, how you do that, how you're mixing is. I will give a demonstration on that later in, the, in, this, in this lecture. But these things matter, and these are the four, four big, big drivers that drive the performance and the cost of a, of a process in the water industry. <laughs> All right, so um, the challenge, the extra challenge, and that's really what makes the job of a water or wastewater treatment or a resource recovery engineer very, very exciting is that the processes are the most complex, I think, of any process industry. Why? Because you have dynamics at the inlet. That's why you cannot control what you put in into the process. If you're a chemical company or a pharmaceutical company, at least you can try to order some products on the market with certain specifications. If you're a wastewater business or a water treatment company, you have to rely on what the environment or the sewer gives you. And that's don't underestimate the challenge of this. So in my, in my opinion, if you are able to engineer such processes, you are able to engineer a lot of processes. And on, on the other hand, if you're able to model such processes, you are able to model a lot of other processes because they are most complex. Why are they complex? Well, you have to make a lot of choices. What is the geometry, my impeller? I mean, there are 100,000 choices to make. Baffles, impeller speed, okay? But then you have water. A temperature with, uh, with heat transfer sometimes, with a density of the of viscosity. Look at anaerobic digestion. I mean, it's a very big challenge, yeah? the mixing. You have bubbles. So you are talking about multi-phase systems. It's not only water, bubbles. You have particles and you have reactions. So all of these things together make it extremely complex. Well, add the layer of dynamics and you have uh, the recipe for an extreme engineering challenge. So the first question is, what if we could completely or partially replace real life experimenting with virtual piloting? Virtual piloting means running simulations instead of real tests. That's the first question. But I think the second question is even more important and that relates to the, the starting point of my lecture, the shift we are making. What if we could not only do that, what if the mathematical models could teach us things we cannot learn through experimenting? Because that's a completely other paradigm shift. Huh? You're not only saving some costs or accelerating your process. You are doing modeling because you simply can learn things you cannot learn. So it's a completely different framework. These two questions are core questions in our business. And the second one becomes more important with the day. Let's make it very practical. Huh? Let's go to an example from R&D. So this is the scale up of a novel electrochemical reactor system. So you can see some fluidization of some particles. It's an electrochemical system being developed at Ghent University. Here they are all washing out. Let's change the reactor a bit. And here, yeah, okay, they are fluidizing, they're recircling. Much better. So the only thing we are doing is we are changing the geometry a bit of this pipe at the bottom. It looks, it looks very simple, huh? 
but it's extremely difficult. Will you build 10 prototypes? Just take, take into account how much time you, it takes you. OK, let's build 10 prototypes. One works. Oh, man, it works. Unfortunately, two years later, you have to scale it up ten, to factor time 10 times more. Because you did trial and error based testing in these 10 trials, you didn't derive principles for scale up. So you have to start the exercise again when you scale up. And that's the whole thing that happens. So there's nothing giving you a principle or a formula. So that's why models are so handy in this phase. Second example, what you see here is a simulation of the inside of a tubular membrane. Uh, so this is just a hollow, hollow membrane, just like a one shaft. And you see the flow going through. The colors uh, indicate the shear forces on the membrane. Of course, you need some shear to clean membranes. Eh? The higher the shear, the, the better your permeate gets through. Also, the concentration polarization decreases. And then you can, you can use models to engineer the membranes, the topology. Can you just imagine? You can engineer the topology of a membrane using simulations. You cannot measure the shear in reality. There is not a sensor. There is not a measurement for it. But you can calculate and simulate it. So if you have such a model, you can bring in a helical shape or do something else, change the geometry. I don't care. But at least you see that the shear is increasing at these ridges here, which leads to a complete shift to the right of this shear stress curve. So same flow rate, same cost of production, but a way better performance of the membrane. It's a model-based engineering. This is what we call virtual prototyping. Uh, another example at the design site. So this is, this is not an R&D question. This is a design example. Together with Air Liquide, I'm putting the logo here of Air Liquide as well, because I know Rudy is also going to participate in this lecture. So yeah, I mean, they are working a lot of, on pure oxygen um, injection. I, I, I find that a very elegant system. Pure oxygen might seem expensive, but if you start thinking about it, it's very elegant huh? because you need way less gas. You can control the whole thing. You can really control your aeration. And it allows you to intensify a bioreactor dramatically. Uh, because aeration, um, just imagine you have to retrofit and intensify a reactor. Well, this is the way to go. Uh, not always, probably, but in many cases, it can be, I can imagine. So they are injecting pure oxygen in these systems. And then, of course, the big question comes, where do you put them? Huh? Because it's expensive. Everybody wants to save on aeration costs. And the reactor has not been built, so you cannot do any measurements. But you still have to build it. So where do we put them? That's the question. Well, you can do, again, these simulations. That's eh? a 1,500 cubic meter reactor. This is the top view. Here are the injectors. And let's look at the velocities. You can see that there is a dark blue, uh, blue zone here. There is some velocities here. Bad mixing. Let's do a small design change. So we shift them half a meter, and we rotate them five degrees. The whole reactor is in a complete mix, and the whole system is moving. Due to this little simulation and this little uh, change, these guys could really save an external pump and a recirculation loop. Huh? I mean, if you think about that, it's also about cost of ownership. It's not only CapEx, but the 20 years of operation. I mean, why wouldn't you do such a simulation, right? If it takes you a few weeks, it doesn't take months. Huh? That's also very important. Eh? Um, yeah, I think that's, 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 that's an example you use often to demonstrate the value. Of course, you can go to way la larger scale. This is the wastewater treatment uh, facility of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. It's one of the biggest plants in Benelux and I think within, within Europe. Um, and again, if you look at simulations, you see that the oxygen is not really optimally distributed. This is a cross section and this is a top view. Red means high concentration, dark blue means low concentration, green is in between. Uh, so yeah, despite you see bubbles everywhere, yeah? if you look at the surface, so we are standing here, this is me and my co-founder, Usman. We didn't have any staff that back then. We, are, we were doing the business, so we had to measure ourselves then uh, in 2017. Uh, the picture was taken from a construction crane. Um, but you can see that we are standing here at the concentration oxygen zone. We are looking at the bubbles, and you would say, My guys, this is perfect, right? Oxygen bubbles everywhere. But then if you look deeper inside, you have a huge zone uh, with, with lower oxygen. And yes, it has an impact, yes, because you are suboptimally using this very expensive reactor. Uh, second, it has some impact on the operations. What if your oxygen sensor is located here versus here? Well, you might have some surprises. And maybe sometimes, maybe it only happens during rain weather. 
And that's even way more difficult to uncover. How, how can you ever figure that out? And then you would recalibrate your sensor maybe. Maybe you, you would change your control algorithm to fix it. In one or the other way, they will fix it. But, uh, but maybe they could have built the plant a bit smaller or saved some costs. Um, these things, if they are done in the design stage, of course, they make a huge difference. Luckily, they had to retrofit the whole thing. So we were involved in helping them to retrofit the aeration of Eindhoven, and now it's currently being built. So the reactors right now are empty. And we visited them with the whole team. Eh? We were really literally walking here. That's a massive experience. That's, uh, we have images and some movies on, uh, on LinkedIn. OK. Are there any questions for now before I continue? No? There are two big challenges, but it's actually three. I discovered there are three challenges behind, and my title slide say, says two. So there are three big challenges I wanted to highlight. The challenge, the first challenge is, regardless of the scale, it's very difficult to obtain the optimal design. A small system or a big system challenge is equal. To illustrate you this, this is also scientifically published uh, by the Ghent University colleagues. My co-founder, Usman, was involved. This is a two liters batch reactor from a lab. Two, two liter bioreactor is a respirometer where you do bacteriological experiments. Uh, what you see here is that the 3D concentrations of oxygen, ammonium, and nitrate in this reactor. So of course, it's coming in with a high concentration. And then you see what happens. Even in this two liters batch reactor, you see huge gradients. I mean, we are talking about gradients of hundreds of percent, 200, 300, 400 percent deviations within a scale of two liters. I just wanted to illustrate you this, that people often assume that these systems are close to ideal, but they are not at all. If you are developing a new technology and you're concluding certain findings based on lab scale experiments done with such devices without asking you these questions, you might have some big surprises later when you are scaling up. Uh, it's really, really important. So this is slow biological kinetics. I'm not talking about fast chemical kinetics where the impact is even more drastic. Yeah? Of course, there are mixing limitations because they cannot stir very, very high speeds because they would destroy the activated sludge flux in this case. So there are some limitations. You could improve the mixing, yes, but there are process limitations. Uh, the second challenge is, unfortunately, water molecules do not scale together with the reactor. That's another thing. I mean, often people assume when they are scaling up that, that these little molecules here just get bigger together with the reactor. But that's unfortunately not the case. Yeah? So the least linear process is scale up. It's very nonlinear. It's not that you make your reactor twice the size, that your impeller has to be twice the size. Maybe you need three little ones. And maybe one of them needs to be placed extremely asymmetric. Who knows? Who knows? So this is unfortunately not true. The reality is this. You get more molecules. Uh, yeah? One impeller, but more molecules, maybe. And that's causing the main nonlinearity in system scale up. Scale up is one of the most ex expensive and uh, difficult exercises when you're a process engineer working on R&D. <clears throat> and the third challenge, and that's more open of an operational challenge, but also a challenge in R&D or in piloting experiments or in design stage, what you really want to know often cannot, cannot be measured. <clears throat> unfortunately. Maybe there's no sensor. Maybe there is a sensor, but it's way too expensive. Or maybe there is a cheap sensor, but you cannot insert it somewhere. Or maybe you would need 100 of them to, to get what you need. That's really the issue. So you would like to know everything as a process engineer, but you can often not measure it. <clears throat> Again, look at this. Huh? If we look at the scheme you have seen already, where are the measurements here? There are big measurements inside your process. What are the setting, what is the temperature? What is the current pressure, yeah? There are certain measurements here. Quantity is easy, flow rate is easy to measure. Quant quali quanti quality, that's another thing. What is the concentration of this little micropollutant right now? Yeah, that's a very difficult question to answer. Quality measurements, input measurements. So if something is coming in, what is the whole organic composition of my water matrix? Difficult question. You have some bulk measurements, but you don't do an, uh, an online LCOCD uh, with organic characterization. <clears throat> so um, 
Let's go to the disruptive use of process simulation. So what do we then offer uh, against all these challenges? Well, these are the four big things in the process technology lifecycle. R&D stage, OK, if you have figured out it works, you bring it onto the market. Your customers will start selecting your technology because it competes with other technologies. Huh? A new RO membrane has to compete with the already existing RO membranes, right? OK, when they select your technology, you're very happy you won the project. They will design it. So the engineering firms start designing a process. They will build it. And then when it's built, your client will start operating it. In all of these stages, models can play a huge role. Because here, I already said, you can help scaling up an optimal design. Here, you can help maybe with virtual piloting instead of real piloting, comparing two technologies. Here, you can, with, uh, with models, help designing your optimal systems before they are built. Just imagine the aeration example I showed. And here, you can use models to measure what you cannot measure, well, to, to predict what you cannot measure based on what you can measure. This is the digital twin application of a model. The good news is, if you start using models here, you can recycle the same model here, you can recycle the same model here, and you can recycle the same model here. So the model that was initially used to design your process can later be turned into a digital twin for smart operation. That's our whole vision behind our company. Of course, now we are doing scattered projects. Some customers start here with us. Some of them start here. Customers that start here with us, we will try to go through the whole cycle with them. Uh, and that's a good use of all the resources of the modeling. <coughs> Case examples, huh? So I, I will devote some time to, to your question later. OK, let's start with an example. Let's start in R&D, yeah? Virtual scale-up of a novel MBR technology. MBR is membrane bioreactor. So it's a bioreactor to treat wastewater with a membrane inside. And the effluent quality, so the treated water quality you get is very good. Why? Because you have bacteria in the first place. And then you have a very sophisticated membrane uh, treating your water very optimally. So the water is almost, almost drinkable. So we had a customer. I'm, I'm using this example a lot. And this is one of our first customers ever, Maizawa Industries. It's a Japanese technology company. We were so happy because in the first year of our business, we could already travel to Japan and have excellent sushi. I love the food culture in Japan. But, and and um, many people have seen this example, but I'm using it over and over again because I love it. And the customer is still working with us. So there are continuous updates. So what is happening here? Huh? These people had a three cubic meters pilot that was there that said, OK, this technology works. So we have to now scale it up and bring it to commercial scale. That's a typical question I already touched upon earlier in this lecture. OK, so they have a three cubic meter pilot. And their question is, how do we get to 100 cubic meters demonstration scale? You, well, everybody should know the costs of this. I mean, you, you, you don't have to be an economist to know it, but this is like a 1 million euros reactor easily, or even more huh? uh, at this scale. Uh, I mean, we are talking about a lot of money. Just this pilot is hundreds of thousands of euros. Just this pilot. I'm not talking even about the man hours of the person operating it or measurements. So, so these are the costs we are talking about. We're not talking about 10,000 euros. Eh? So what if, what if we would build the CFD model of this little pilot? We would do very good validation. So we make sure our model is really describing this process very, very well. And what if we would then virtually scale up? So we do virtual piloting, virtual scale up, virtual prototyping, whatever you call it. We build five, six, seven prototypes of the full scale. And we compare the affluent quality of each of them. This is BOD, ammonium concentration for five different designs. And one of them has a very, very good, very good permeate quality for certain reasons. What are the reasons? Well, we played with the baffles, the shape, the size, aspect ratios, inlet configurations, cycle time. I mean, you cannot name it. Bubble size, all these variables. So this one here that was simulated first is this one here on the picture, currently in operation in, in Tokyo. And for us, this is such a great feeling because we were with the customer in this stage. A few years later, they have a successful almost full-scale installation. Now they are working with us to go to 1,000 cubic meters, so an order of magnitude even higher. And that will be the final commercial scale. Uh, but these customers were so excited because, one, OK, they saved a lot of money. But second, they, they have a, a level of process understanding that is unprecedented. So if you also 
look at selling this technology, well, they will, will sell it with a lot of confidence. Um, so they easily in this first stage, I mean, I'm very conservative, they easily saved 200,000 euros. Uh, but the time to market in this first stage already reduced with one year. Can you just imagine that you save a whole year in, if you're in a very competitive red ocean market and you want to introduce a new wastewater technology, but you save a year? That is huge. It's huge because you lose. Who knows eh? when these times get there without the models, when these guys get there, maybe the opportunity is lost. So it's, it's really, you, you should not underestimate the economical impact of the acceleration. To me, that's most of the value even. Um, well, when we go to the second stage, yeah, technology selection. So just imagine this MBA comes onto the market, it starts competing with other technologies. This is the phase here. So this is an example on virtual piloting for technology assessment and comparison. So our customer, Waterscap de Dommel, which is a Dutch wastewater treatment utility, the, the same people that are operating the Eindhoven plant I showed. Yeah? They are, uh, just like many utilities, looking at how do we remove micropollutants. Micropollutants are pharmaceutical residues, pesticides in the wastewater. Huh? They are all going to the rivers if you don't treat them out. So now they are thinking about how do we remove them. There, is, there are different problems. Huh? One, there's a, a time pressure because the government is giving subsidies for such technologies, but you have to build the installation within two years. Second, they have no experience with this technology. It's a chemical treatment technology, for example, ozonation. And these are biological wastewater treatment engineers. So in a matter of months, they have to know everything about ozonation and then guide a whole design project of a plant of maybe 15 million euros, 20 million euros. Can you just imagine what, 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 what happens? Third, they would start piloting because, okay, let's throw some pilot on our plants and look if they are getting removed, guys. Add some ozone and, and look. Well, you have to sample. One sample for micropollutant removal or analysis costs hundreds, maybe 500 euros. One sample, yeah? One, yeah? It's one data point. One data point costs you 500 euros. So yeah, 10 data points, okay, 5K. And then there is still a lot of uncertainty because the, 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 the conditions are varying all the time. I mean, how, how do you derive the exact knowledge from that? So then you have to, let's do some piloting. The piloting will probably cost you, piloting, eh? not full scale, piloting will cost you 200 to 400 thousands of euros. It will also take you three months at least, but that's very optimistic, two, two years. Uh, all these measurements, you need full-time operators. You need the safety because ozone comes with uh, safety concerns. Nobody has experience with that. Uh, and then they still gain very limited insights because they have data points that cost you 500 euros for one data point. I mean, that's a big struggle. Uh, and, and then they have to do this whole thing without prior experience. So they are biological engineers and they have to do this whole exercise. So you have to maybe hire than external consulting firms that are getting paid to walk you through this conventional process. That's what happens. So the thing is, what happens if you would build a virtual plant what, what, if, what if you would build a virtual plant? So you have some data at your plant, and huh? they have these data. Huh? Function of time, they have sensors at the effluent. They know which flow, they know the DOC if they put the sensor, they know the ammonia, they know the UV-254, that's the absorption of your organics. They know these things. What if we take a couple of samples of their effluent, send them to a lab for very small scale oz ozone testing to check basic ozone kinetics? That's what we do here. And what if we then would calibrate our virtual plant, we sent the real plant data through this virtual plant, and we try to predict what's going to be the micro removal, what's going to be the risk of byproduct formation, what is going to be the operational cost, uh, the size of the installation, things like that. Yeah? The thing is, we tested around nine dosing scenarios in six weeks. So, but not only that, of course, you have the whole chemical model behind. So if you see a certain removal, you 100% understand why this removal occurs. You, you really know why this peak of ammonia causes a dip in your byproduct formation, for example, because the kinetics are very complex. So it's not only then, okay, the cost saving, time saving again, but these people are experts in ozonation right now because they are good witness the whole process. We have done it for three of their plants. 
So this is just one on the slides. Again, well, now they decided to build it. We will use the, the same models with them to help designing the plants. When they are designed, we will use the same models again to be a digital twin for real-time micro uh, prediction, real-time bromate prediction. None of them have a sensor on the market. Huh? It's impossible. So this is what we are going to do. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I know I sound very excited and it's all too good to be true, but uh, I mean, I really believe in this and our customers also. Uh, that's why I'm so enthusiastic. Yeah, then talking about these assumptions at the lab scale, eh, I was talking about this batch test and you add some chemicals and see what happens. Well, here's the thing. Typically, the conventional way of ozone testing on the market is take a grab sample from the wastewater treatment plants. So you take your beaker, okay? Let's add some ozone like this, and we see what happens. Stir and take some measurements. Well, if you do a CFD simulation with the integrated kinetics of such a batch test, that's really a very interesting thing that happens. So you add your ozone, and the cloud goes around, and it takes you seconds to get mixed. But in these few seconds, you already, of course, uh, have all the reactions almost completed. So the reactions are way faster than the mixing. That's a problem. Well, OK, ozone, that's thing. But what, what if we look at bromate, which is a byproduct, and you don't want this? It's all happening here, right? It's all happening here. So I, I didn't pause it, but there's a, like a red cloud in the first milliseconds. So let's say. 30, 40, 50% of your bromate is formed in the first milliseconds because you just locally dose your ozone. Um, and if you look at your micropollutant removal, this is the one pharmaceutical, it gets removed locally. We are talking about a 200 milliliters batch reactor, huh? 200 milliliters. That looks completely stirred. So people just have to realize this. The impact of it is this. They use these experiments to extrapolate to full scale design. Well, this is what happens. This is the bromate formation in a batch test. But when put, people really put the plant in place, a full scale over pilot, suddenly they observe this bromate formation. Uh, simply because the conditions at full scale or pilot scale are way more interesting than a, than, a, than a batch test where you really add everything in a concentrated mode. But you cannot name how many plants were not built because of such conclusions. They, they could have uh, worked, I'm pretty sure. But people conclude there will be way too high bromate formation in our plants uh, because this is unknown. So that's just one example, a side effect I wanted to, we will scientifically publish this. We are working on this with various parties uh, to really get this into the literature. It's, uh, it's important. So what we believe, yeah, in some cases, a model, really what we believe in some cases, yeah, not all the cases, a model can provide more accurate data and more insights compared to real life experiments for a fraction of the cost and effort. Uh, and it's a whole other paradigm shift because often people, that's the first question, and I will definitely get questions from the audience. How do you validate? How do you make sure the models are accurate? I understand the question is the number one question. And I, on purpose, I didn't put it on the slide because it will, it will come anyway. Yeah? But the thing is, we all always turn it around. Just turn it around. What if your experiments are just flawed? Your setup is completely not representative for what you want to obtain. It might be even misleading. So it's much more important than a deviation from a model that gives you at least the trends. Um, this is a very, I mean, strong expression, eh? I know, and I also see the value of validation. I see the value of experimenting, but I just wanted to wake up everybody that this can happen, uh, that a model is better suited than a measurement for a very complex system. So when you have selected the technology, you have to design it before you build it. Uh, it's a very, very complex exercise. There are a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge here comes when somebody has to design a process uh, under unconventional circumstances. What I mean with this is you have certain space limitations. So maybe the reactor shape has to be slightly different than the 10 previous plants you have designed, causing uncertainty. Maybe at this specific site, the water composition is really something exotic. Or maybe there is one certain pollutant that we never faced before, even though we have built 20 plants with this technology. Or maybe there is some local regulation that is suddenly like imposed, and you have to have way more stringent requirements, or maybe have requirements for a pollutant you never had to remove in the past. 
don't underestimate the complexity of this because even if you are a very experienced design engineer and you have designed like 50 plants, these are very, very difficult questions. Why? Because if you have built it and it doesn't work, you have built a plant of 15, 20, 25 million euros. And it's, it's a lot of stakes here. Huh? There are a lot of stakes here. So in this stage, we are especially focusing on giving people better sleepless nights on one hand. And on the other hand, um, improving the process performance in the long term. So also looking at the cost of ownership of this person, the end user, that has to operate this plant for 20 years. Yeah, it's not for five years. It's 20, 25 years. So this is what we are focusing on here. Uh, I'm now going on purpose away from the wastewater field, away from the reactor field, because I covered these things already a lot. I'm now going to focus on big basins, because I wanted to show something of a big scale and uh, to just expand the horizon a bit. What you see here is a big basin. It's like a, a pond of 3 million, 3.5 million cubic meters of water, which is big. It's in the northern Netherlands, in Omdijk. So they are taking uh, water from the Ezel Lake in this case. Uh, it's a, the drinking water company PWN. So the first step in surface water-based drinking water production is such a basin. That's the first step. You are pumping your water in, and it's like the big reservoir of water waiting there to be treated. And afterwards, be put in the, 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 the network to the people. That's the first step. But there are, this, it's quite complex, uh, the things that are happening here. For example, if you do a CFD simulation of such a process, you can see that the flow is coming in, it goes to the right. And there is actually, in this case, a big short circuiting at the right side. Here you see some uh, w images with a drone. How this flow in reality also goes to the left, right? So we validate this whole thing. So the model is really predicting this. And you can see with the white cloud taking really this angle. And so this short circuiting stream means that in fact, maybe one third, 40%, so 30%, 40% of your business is not very well used uh, in this case. Well, why is this a problem? Well, if you look at these basins, they have two big goals, two of them. Well, let's say three, but two, two that matter for us. The, the third one I'm going to remove already is the storage. Of course, you want some water to be treated always there. Even if it's a dry summer, at least you have a basin filled with some water. Everybody understands. But then. The most important process thing here of this basin is, first one is peak shaving. So just imagine your chlorine levels go like this in the acyl lake, and you're pumping into your basin. Just imagine the basin would not be there. The dynamics would come into the plant like this. We already covered dynamics. This is the biggest challenge of a process. So if you can level off these dynamics, you already one half. That's one function of the basins. To level of dynamics, you need theoretically a basin that is completely mixed. So a drop of water comes in, it gets mixed completely over the whole basin. That is theoretically maximal peak shaving. Your peak will never be visible at the end. But there is a conflict of interest because there is a second objective, which is HRT, hydraulic residence time. Hydraulic residence time means they also use these basins to treat there is some sunlight working on the basin. There is some settling happening. You can also consider it a treatment process. It's not only a storage process or a peak shaving process. It is also a treatment process. Your water quality actually improves in such a basin if it's there for 60, 100, 150, 200 days. So, but that process requires a high HRT. The ideal HRT is a plug flow because your drop comes in here and it has to travel the whole residence time up, 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 and then reaches the outlet after 80 days. Because if you have a completely mixed system, this one drop partially already removes, well, is leaving the system after one second. Huh? So you have to balance the two. So the big engineering question is, how do you design such a basin then, if you have these two conflicting objectives? Well, uh, either you, you have the theoretical plug flow, very good at HRT, very bad at peak shading, Either you design for a perfect mix, but it's very bad at HRT, very good at peak shaving, huge in energy consumption because you have to mix with air. Huh? And uh, maybe you have to go to a hybrid regime where you maybe have first a mixing zone and then you have a plug flow zone. Maybe that's the potential uh, thing you can design for. In reality, these questions are not typically asked. And in reality, you typically have something, a, a non-ideal hybrid, like the one I showed with the CFD simulation.
you have a certain short circuiting with a very short residence time. And then you have a zone that is there forever like for 200 or 250 days. So the, the, the distribution on residence time is big. Not only, like that, not only that, it is non-controllable. So we are engineers, we are not control, in control of this process. That's the problem of it. So you can do simulations, you can look at, okay, what if we switch off the aeration? What if the inlet flow rate changes and look at the mixing patterns? For example, here, these two figures at the left compare the scenario of the same basin with aeration on. These big red spots here are big aerators giving bubbles that cause mixing. Of course, the whole basin changes. This is a completely different basin than this one, even though the design is completely the same. The only thing that changed is that you switched on the aeration. So what do we do here? Well, of course, we help answering questions. And maybe we should change the inlet location. Maybe we should change the outlet location. Can we save aeration energy? Should aeration be on all the time? Should two aerators be on all the time or just one during a specific period? Uh, can we maybe, instead of building 10 aerators, two ones? Which bubble size do they need? Which depth? I mean, these are the questions we want to then answer with simulation. Second, you talk about how do you, do, how do you go to digital twins from CFD models? Well, we had a specific case here. So our customer here wanted to know what the impact of upstream dynamics in the ISO lake was going to be on the, on the downstream plant. Why? Because of climate change, they have dry summers in Belgium, Netherlands. I mean, it's getting drier and drier. You wouldn't conclude that based on the last summer, but if you look at the last five, six summers, it is true. Drier summers means more evaporation, less rainfall, so more chloride levels in the ISO lake. So chloride is going up. You have to remove chloride to a certain extent. So the question is, if these chloride levels change, how, they, how will they travel through the basin and how long will it take until the operation really has to take specific measures? They had many questions, but it was one of the questions. Well, then you cannot really use the CFD model to answer that question. Why? Because the residence time in such a basin is close to 100, 150 days. So you would have to run a CFD simulation of 150 days in real time. So it would take you months of runtime on a computer. <clears throat> yeah, that's a bit of a problem, even more. I mean, it's not realistic. So what we do then, yeah, we use the CFD model to break down the basin in zones. So we call it compartmentalization. We built a compartmental model. So we identify mixing zones. And all these mixing zones are, are interconnected. You can see that the flow is coming in. Volume 7 is interacting with volume 5 and 8. So it gets some flow here, most of the flow here, because you have seen that the flow goes mainly in that direction. There's some backflow, things like that. But V6 is not in connection with V7. Conceptually, it looks like this. So each of the zones is considered one mixed zone. But the whole basin is not considered as a mixed zone. The blue data is what is going out of the basin in chlorides. So this is the, uh, the chloride concentration at the outlet, the blue dots. We want to predict it. If you would consider the basin completely mixed, you would have this gray line. You can see that you have actually perfect peak shaving. I just explained to you, if you assume your model to be completely mixed, you will, shave, you will shave all of the peaks. If you use the compartmental model instead, you have this orange line, and it gets better with time, because here you have to assume some initial conditions. Uh, so it gets better with time and nicely captures what's happening in the dynamics. In fact, this model is so fast that it can now run in real time. But it contains the information from the CFD model. So that's the hybrid we use. We used it in this system, but we use it in reactors every day as well. Yeah. So this is the trick we use, and it really, really works out very nicely. <clears throat> we do use it for ozonation, pellet softeners, I mean, uh, other chemical processes, bioreactors, all kinds of, including fermenters. This is the, a concept we use very often. Yeah. So. Um, and then, yeah, we go to the digital, to the operations. OK, just imagine you have designed your process. We're all happy, guys. We have used a model to design our process. It will work optimally. Just one final step, the operation. So we have to start using the process now for 20 years. But who knows what happens in 20 years? Who knows five years from now, the, the plant will get an extension? Who knows five years from now, suddenly there will be an industrial discharge, or maybe the flow rate will double or maybe um, part of the city will leave. 
or maybe a new part of the city will come. Uh, who knows, due to climate change, the water quality will drastically change. DOC goes from 10 to 15. We have no clue, but the plant was designed at a certain point. So the plant now has to be in operation successfully for 20 years. But you really don't know what's going to happen these 20 years. So the thing is, what if you would already have this model and now use the same model for the operation? Uh, not only for the operation, so there are two things. Predicting what you cannot measure based on what you can measure. That's purely operational. For example, your micro pollutant removal in real time, very handy. Second, to conduct what if scenario analysis. So you have your virtual plant, which is on the screen here, and the operator can just start simulating a future scenario. Guys, we will bring in a new flow and within two years from now, what would be the impact on this plant? Of course, we will not test it in reality. I think everybody agrees that we just don't switch on the valve. So this is what you can also use the model for. So we are now looking at digital twins. <clears throat> now, digital twin is a big hype. Huh? Look at this graph. This is the graph showing the use, how much, how many times the phrase digital twin is used as a function of time. Something happened in 2014. Digital twin was non-existing until 2014, and then everybody starts talking about AI, and it's like, uh, it's not exponential, it's something else. It's exponential of exponential. So it's a hype, huh? we cannot neglect it. I just wanted to show this because it gives some perspective uh, why everybody is talking about it. But it went so fast that few people know what they are really talking about. <laughs> and to refer to that, some people you might know, but people I know quite well, I talked to lately. For example, Imre, he's the, uh, he's a very good friend and a partner we work with, uh, uh, the founder of Dynamita, the company delivering yeah, software. Sumo software. He says, yeah, digital twin guys, they exist for decades, from the 80s. They are now only called that way. That's his opinion. And he has a point, eh? mathematical modeling or process models are not new. Eh? They, are, they exist for 20, 30, 40 years. Then we have uh, somebody from the company, Rittmeyer, David, is also a good friend of mine. Uh, maybe before we start all using it, we should decide what it means. And now we have somebody, uh, eh, Professor Dragan Savic from KWR, and he says everybody seems to have a known definition. So yes, there is no consensus and many people are working on it. And of course, the AM team definition, a digital tool that allows you to visualize what you cannot measure based on what you can measure. That's what we call a digital twin. So yeah, everybody is right and wrong, but someday, and, and the, yeah, someday we will come to unified uh, phrase. But yeah, actually, if we look at digital twin, to us, it has to do with operations. So let's look at the operations. For example, you have the real plant, because that's a digital twin, eh? you have a twin. You don't have a twin if the other child is not existing. So both childs are, are existing, the virtual one and the real one. So you have your real plant and you have your virtual plant. The virtual plant is actually a copy of your real process. It contains the chemistry that also happens here. It contains the flows that come in also here. And it contains even the process controls, your PID controllers, all of it, that's also here. Yeah, that's a digital twin. So that's a, a digital ozonation plant in this case with our model Amazon. Uh, here we go to the, the core thing, eh? like the core value. So what we show on the screen, and again, I'm, I'm showing data because it helps. Uh, I'm not showing sh just a model, I, I show measurement data here. This is real measurement data, uh, not too much to argue about. So what we see here is the uh, data. I cannot sh tell exactly what plant or what variable it is due to confidentiality reasons, but I just can show you this dynamics data of a period of four years, let's say. So it's a very important variable. You cannot measure it in real time, but you can only take grab samples from time to time and analyze it in a lab. And a few days later or a week later, you get results. That's what the dots are here as, as, as function of plant operation. Why does it change? Because the water quality changes, the temperature changes, the seasons change, and the operator also makes certain decisions. That's causing the dynamics. Very complex what's behind. So uh, our model actually predicts all of these dynamics. So this is a real digital twin of a plant. It's not working in real time yet, but the model was built and now it's a matter of integrating it in this, into the SCADA system. So I can call it nearly real time because these people can send us data every week and we just, so it's now a matter of just making the coupling, the final coupling. If they do that, they have a real time measurement of the variable they could not measure before. 
but it's the, the key variable of their process. Yeah, and that's, that is the power of what if scenarios. So you have these four years of operation with a very ex expensive plant. We are talking about the demonstration plant of millions of euros here. Yeah, it's demonstration plants of millions of euros. You, we can just recycle the, f the four past years of effort and ask ourselves the question, what if we would have those differently? So we just run the same four years again and again and again with other settings. So can you just imagine? I mean, if, if they want this information, the reality is impossible. But now the operator can say, oh, what if I, I still remember this peak, guys? What, had, what if we would have dosed differently at this moment? They can do it. They can do it with the model. So that's really, I mean, the value of digital twins, measuring what you cannot measure or predicting what you cannot measure, and also these what if scenarios, virtual uh, plants, uh, playing with the virtual plants. A third dimension I didn't touch upon yet. Just imagine a team of young process engineers or young operators, they are just graduated, are hired by this company and they need to be trained to operate as plants. Just imagine in the future, they can just put up the goggles uh, and uh, they are in the office, eh? they are not at the plant. Eh? They are in the office, they go to the control room. Okay, let's just blow up this whole reactor, guys. Let's screw up the whole settings. They can just virtually screw up the whole reactor. They can learn why it would explode. They can learn why. Can you just imagine how fast the learning would be? Also for operators, next to Doing that, they would understand why it's important. And that is the, really the core thing that is often missing. So that is towards the future, uh, using goggles to look at the reactor and you look through the wall or you're in your office and you're just walking through your plant and screwing up, screwing up things virtually. But then, yeah, also smart, I, what we call smart process control becomes possible. Smart process control, it's even more than predicting the variable you couldn't measure. You really know what's happening because, for example, here you see the impact of ammonia in your water on the formation of bromate, which is the byproduct you don't want. You can see that you have some peaks sometimes, and then you have some equal dips in bromates. Why is this happening? If you understand this, you can control the whole plant to minimize or maximize a certain beneficial impact. Uh, very interesting because the kinetics are here. Again, you only see this because we have a real-time model. If you would take, which is typically the case, 24-hour composite samples, you would never, never see what's happening here. It's impossible. So people's eyes open, and that what happens then, then they start questioning, is this true or not, guys? Because they didn't know about it before, and now you come with something they have to know. So they start questioning this a lot. So the first step we will have to do is validate this whole thing that is really true with a lot of high-frequency samples. That's what we will have to do. Um, so you can see the nice correlation. Eh? And uh, if you look at that, you can, yeah, probably, for example, if you want to remove micropollutants, operate your upstream biological plant way better in order to have beneficial use of your downstream ozonation process. It's a level many people are not thinking about. Everybody is looking at one process at a time. But they are also, I mean, the whole train downstream is interacting. So you can have huge energy savings and huge performance increases if you really look at the integrated train. Also, a vision of the future of our company is to have an integrated model that just connects all these units. Um, that will be very important. Before I go to the conclusions, I uh, want to ask again if there are questions. What we are working on is the mechanistic models. And if you look at the two big categories, you have mechanistic models and data-driven models. Right? These are the, like the big groups. And, uh, and of course, you have something in between which are called hybrid frameworks, which is they are working together. I think. All of them will play a major role. They, have, they will have distinct um, properties that, that are, cannot be easily replaced with another framework. For example, what I question a lot is if you really have to try to replace mechanistic models with a data-driven model, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. But if you ask me, I think it's smarter to put all the focus on the questions first that mechanistic models cannot answer. Um, that's, that's probably what I, where I would put the priorities. So yes, probably there will be in the future some opportunities, but still, the, if you look at the big disadvantage of data-driven models is you need a hell of a lot of data. Second, you need a lot of time to collect that data and for dynamics to occur and then to figure out what's happening. And still you remain with a black box. 
So the, the, the question, that the big question still is, even if you have a successfully trained, it's not calibrated, but a trained AI model on a plant, but you drastically change the conditions in the future, the big question is, will this AI still be very, very well performing? Because now it's suddenly in an area where it was not trained for. And to me, that question will not get answered in the first five to 10 years. <laughs> Definitely, if you, not, if you look at automated operation, I mean, without an operator in between and AI deciding on the operations. If you look at mechanistic models, it's way easier to reason about that. That you know what they are doing not and well. So I see them very well collaborating. So for example, some mechanisms are way too complex to describe what mechanistic models AI can help. Maybe there is a huge amount of data that needs to be automatically processed. AI can help and then feed that model, like feed that data to the mechanistic model. Maybe the AI is good at getting trained at detecting when a sensor is really getting fault or a sensor is failed. Again, it helps the input to the mechanistic model. Maybe there is a certain parameter in your mechanistic model that is very hard to describe or has a lot of uncertainty. And maybe you put a sub-model with a hybrid framework of an AI model. I mean, I'm, I'm not going very deep, eh? but I see a lot of collaboration. I don't see a lot of replacement. Because also, if I look at the, the training aspect eh, with an operator with goggles and, and the, the person is getting trained with turning some controls, I'm not sure how it will work with data-driven models, uh, how you can do that. Yeah, I'm not sure how you can do what-if scenario with a data-driven model. Maybe I'm, of course, I'm not an expert here. Eh? I'm missing a lot of points probably, but currently I don't see it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, these five, uh, these four big trends has had play a major role for our business, but probably they are playing a major role in the whole digital revolution we are seeing now, I think. So these four things are really coming together at the very right moment, well, all, all at the same moment. Eh? First, you have very, very important societal and market pressures. Eh? We cannot neglect climate change, even though N2O emissions were not high on the agenda 10 years ago. Currently, it's a very big point. So in the past, everybody was saying, OK, let's save energy. And oh, yeah, maybe we can sell it as greenhouse gas reduction. Now it becomes the first priority, even if it costs some more or I don't know. Climate change cannot be neglected. There are a lot of countries putting it in the regulation. Uh, same with, with, with priority components and so micropollutants. If it becomes part of the regulation, you cannot escape anymore. Population growth in certain areas, smarter end users. So the end users that used to rely in the past 100% on an engineering company or on a company like AM team, they are now building internal expertise on engineering or on digital. So uh, it's a big trend. Resource efficiency, of course. Process intensification, doing more with smaller reactors, smaller footprints intensify, uh, for example, the shift from, uh, yeah, of course, the standard shift uh, from flock, flux sludge to granular sludge. That's a very nice example here. And the speed, the speed of society, uh, uh, if we go back to the MBR company, one year saving right now is way more than one year saving 10 years ago because the speed of society is unprecedented. So there's a lot of pressure here that really asks Guys, can we accelerate or answer more with digital tools? On the other hand, there is a general acceptance of digital. If we now start selling models as a company, people will uh, have a meeting with us. 10 years ago, they would have said, yeah, these guys are dreaming uh, because it's just at the top agendas and companies. Everybody wants a digital roadmap. Every major company wants this. So if you have a company now um, yeah, like us that contributes to it, they will listen. So that's good for us, of course. On the other hand, we have very good simulation models and very good simulation tools. We know a lot about the processes, way more due to scientific knowledge, of course, also. But they are available. And then, of course, the only thing you then have left is running your models, computing power. So currently, we do our, at this very moment in our company, simulations are running on massive computers that were completely impossible 10 years ago, completely impossible. Today, they are extremely valuable. Uh, and that's because of this. Uh, so these four things are very, very important for us. And probably, yeah, if you just extend it for the digital future. So this is to conclude a bit. Um, I think the potential of digital tools is, so this brings everything a bit together. 
Acceleration of technology development cycles, so lowering time to market. Make sure this beautiful new technology gets to the market way faster to solve all these problems. Acceleration of tech adoption, so the market uptake, because uh, we were talking about it, even if you have a brilliant solution, it takes you a decade huh, to, to really get it there. So that can help optimal design of long living infrastructure that has to be there for 20 years and continuous updating and continuous optimal use of existing infrastructure. Just going back to the example of a future water quality change within five years, you can predict today, for example. And then, of course, the last one is the acceleration and the enhancement of learning. So a, a top manager in a company that never was is, is, is working on a plant on a daily basis can still run a, a simulation. And that person will way better understand the, how, how to run that business or that company or that utility. Uh, so I, I, I think this will be very important. So there's a lot of complexity in models at the back end, but the front end is very simple. You see a screen, your virtual plan, and you can turn a bit of buttons. That's where we are going. Uh, I, we strongly believe in this and then combined with the new things that like, um, yeah, um, what is it, VR, AR, all these things. Yeah, it was in a nutshell uh, the summary. <laughs> okay, so yeah, follow us on LinkedIn. Eh? If you want more information, we are putting a lot of content out there. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody.